Um, I would like to acknowledge uh, that I'm near what is now known as Ottawa, and I'm on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg Nation. Uh, we are so happy to have a large number of participants today joining us from a variety of locations across the country and beyond, as you we saw earlier. Uh, so I would encourage you to take a moment uh, to reflect on the traditional Indigenous territory that you find yourselves in and acknowledge it. So I'm Catalina McAfee. I work with the Canadian Forest Service and have worked on several restoration initiatives, often with the goal to improve caribou habitat and support caribou recovery. Uh, this work included the sharing of best practices and led to desire to have a central repository for information and publications. And that led to my participation in the development of the CCLM portal. I'll be one of your uh, MCs today. I also wanna introduce Kevin Kimball. He will be facilitating the panel discussion after our main presentation. Uh, Kevin is a professional biologist in Alberta and works for the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology as a business development lead supporting applied research. And he was also one of the first members of the CCLM and is a big supporter of knowledge to practice and science extension. Uh, so a little bit about the CCLM. Uh, the CCLM was launched in April of 2020, and we hope by now that you've each heard about the CCLM and hopefully used it, but as we saw, a lot of people will be trying it out as of today, moving forward. Uh, we started the work in 2019 when five collaborating organizations came together to address, address the lack of a centralized place to share and exchange information and learnings in conservation and landscape activation. Um, so the found Founding members, the five founding members that I just mentioned, and I think we want to go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so the NBCKC, which is a National Boreal Caribou Knowledge Consortium, uh, Natural Resource Canada, Canadian Forest Service, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Inatech Alberta, and the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology Center for Boreal Research. We also want to thank all of our supporters who made this, who are making the CCLM possible. So that includes Canada's Oil Sense Innovation Alliance, Alberta Innovates, and the Grand Prairie Regional Innovation Network. And last but not least, uh, Fuse Consulting. And the result of this collaboration is a powerful go-to site for all things related to conservation and land management. So reports, great literature, peer-reviewed materials, best practice guides, etc. Uh, can be found here. So you'll see here uh, a screenshot of the um, of the portal and the first thing you'll see is like what can we help you find and you can type in anything and we're hoping really to get you to the right information you're looking for. Uh, so as I mentioned the portal has been live for over a year and research resources and viewership are growing. Uh, so we have about 13,000 visitors since the launch, 1,300 resources and 150 projects on the Boreal Caribou interactive map. And we, we're not showing you the interactive map, but if you have a chance, go check it out. It's really, really cool. Uh, so now that the portal is established, we are starting to focus on mobilizing the information housed there. And this is the second of a recurring seminar series where we like to invite speakers to discuss key topics in conservation and land management. Uh, so a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, all participants are muted as you probably noticed. Um, so we're having a, a presentation by Nicholas Koops and Rick Knighton. And after that, there will be about 10 minutes uh, time for questions. We ask that you put your questions in the chat and we will read them out. After that, there's a panel discussion. And um, if there's time after the panel discussion, uh, there'll be the same system. Um, if there's time for questions, you can put your questions in the chat and one of our moderators will read them out. Um, if you have any questions or technical issues, you can uh, message Riel Massey Leclerc for, for support. And I think without further ado, I would like to introduce our two speakers of today. Um, so very pleased to have with us today is uh, Nicholas Koops. He's a professor at the University of British Columbia and a Canada, Canada research chair in remote sensing. He is the head of the Integrated Remote Sensing Studio within the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. It's a research lab investigating and demonstrating applications of remote sensing data to environmental and forest production issues with 30 PhD, MSc, and postdocs. He has published over 
an astounding 500 peer-reviewed journal papers and was the editor-in-chief, uh, Jeff, sorry, <laughs> editor-in-chief of the Canadian Journal of Remote Sensing for a decade. In 2020, Nicholas was a joint winner of the Marcus Wallenberg Prize for his research into satellite analysis and numerical modeling of three and forest growth. And joining him today is Rick Knudsen. He is a PhD candidate working with Nicholas Koops, investigating the potential of drone-based imaging for applications relevant to monitoring ecological restoration projects. He is demonstrating the operational, operationality of current technology. Ongoing research is focused on developing tools and techniques for mapping vegetation structure, community composition, plant richness, as well as invading species. Future work will demonstrate how mapping products of ecocytes can be compared, enabling the use of ecological references based on drone data. Rick obtained a degree in human geography and geographical information management at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, so I will pass it on to you. I think you're going to share your screen and thanks again for joining us today. Many thanks everyone and thank you very much for the nice welcome. Thank you Catalan for introducing us so well and uh, many thanks to the, the Knowledge Network for allowing us to talk today. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the panelists. It's fantastic that uh, the networks pulled together such a esteemed group of panelists to join us at the end. So I thank them for their time as well uh, and look forward to their insights on, on this topic. We are certainly not the only people working in the area. So it's great to see such strong representation from other groups as well. I want to excite you. I want you to leave this meeting feeling as though remote sensing is one of the most critically important tools that you can use for, for environmental impacts. I think you probably know that, which is why you're all on the call, but I wanna give you a flavor of where we're at and what is so exciting about the last few years and the future five years in remote sensing. Why have things changed so quickly and so excitingly? So I wanna give you that flavor uh, in 20 minutes uh, and then Rick will give us um, his very detailed work uh, that he's doing in Alberta and real zoom in on a particular case study that we can talk about as well. Just the way we've, we've laid out the plan for the half hour. So we face many challenges uh, when we think about our environment. Uh, this idea of using remote sensing and other geospatial data is critical as an input to help us understand both what's happening and then help us understand what remedial action we might choose to take. And as I said, lots of different data sets are around today, which I, I want to challenge you to think about their use and how you might use them in your work. So what has changed? Well, one thing has changed in the last decade, free and open global access to high quality remote sensing data products. Five or 10 years ago, 15 years ago, remote sensing data was a, was a, private, a private data set. It was produced by companies or governments that couldn't really distribute the data particularly well, and maybe you had to pay for it. Today, we've had a massive change in the way we look at remote sensing data. Virtually every remote sensing platform put up by a government is now producing free and open data. And that's massively changing our access to that data and the quality of it. Because we're no longer just buying individual scenes of individual places. We're not stamp collecting our way over Canada anymore. We're now producing wall-to-wall -wall global or national products that really change the way we think about the Earth. Now, the poster child for this is a Landsat series of satellites, which has a 30 meter spatial resolution, which all of you know about. But why are we still so excited with Landsat? Well, Landsat gives us the ability to go away and see things consistently over time since 1972. And the data is entirely free and open. So using that data consistently over time gives us the ability to go away and see land cover and land cover change. Now, when I was a master's student, just a little boy, my supervisor, my supervisor bought me one satellite image of one particular area and it cost him $6,000. I don't even think about Landsat scenes anymore. I think about a pixel and I think about drilling that pixel from 1972 through to today. And how is that pixel changing on a two week time scale over that 50 year period? When you think about Landsat like that, it's extraordinary in the level of detail that you get. Now, the Canadian government and the Canadian Forest Service is pioneering the way we think about these layers. These are NTEMS layers. They're, they're Canada-wide mosaics of Landsat data that's allowing us to go away and look at change. 
Mike Walder, Joanne White, and the team over there are producing these national products for the forested regions of Canada that allow us to go away and think about change. This is 80,000 US, um, 80,000 Landsat scenes all stuck together in a supercomputer. And then I've drilled, they have drilled through every pixel over time to look for change, allowing us to go away and see things like fire, harvest, beetle, infestation, new infrastructure, and agriculture. And using that information, we can start to get national level layers of how our landscape is changing. On the left, an annual Landsat image. On the right, the change that is detected from Landsat. So this is Alberta. You can see the extraordinary amount of change we've seen across this landscape. We're seeing oil and gas, rest, um, oil and gas activities. We're seeing fire, we're seeing harvest. All of this observable at a 30 by 30 meter pixel through time. So this gives us a broad brush of the change we're seeing. Not everyone can use Landsat for everything, but it gives us that broad brush view of change and landscape pattern that then can inform about finer scale patterns later on. Every single layer that's produced by this program is online, accessible and free from the NFIS. If you go there and look under satellite data products, you can download, download 30 meter, 30 meter, wall to wall, Canada wide, forested areas, maps of change, of disturbance, of their date, all of this information is available. And this is because of the accessibility of Landsat imagery. So this has been a massive change in satellite data in the last decade or so, our ability to go away and get that data and, and produce those types of products. There's always this trade-off though. Landsat 16 days, 30 meter spatial resolution, but you might say to me, Nicholas, I don't want 30 meters, I want finer. I want finer scale patterns and I want them at a finer scale in terms of time. Maybe you're looking at phenology. Maybe you're looking at biodiversity. Maybe you're looking at things that you don't want to wait 16 days or in reality might become a month, two months, three months with cloud. I want to go away and actually want to see change at a finer temporal scale and perhaps a finer spatial scale. So this is where we see this trade-off. How do we do that when our satellites are locked in particular orbits? We do this work uh, in Alberta with the Foothills Research Institute, and we've been working for over a decade with the Grizzly Bear Program. The Grizzly Bear Program is very focused on aspects regarding bears, in particular their food and the snow that relates to their denning. So their food, I don't want an annual map from Landsat of food. That's not gonna help me with bear management because I wanna know what are they eating in spring, summer and fall. So I need better temporal information to understand the food resource. Likewise for snow, I don't want that just once a year. I wanna know when do we start to see snow accumulating on the landscape? When do we see snow melting on the landscape? So I can try to think about how do I bring in finer temporal information? At a very field scale level, we can go and put in phenological cameras. So this is a phenological camera. It's black because when I put them in the fields in Alberta, people shoot them. So I have to paint them so they can't see them. So that's a camera that's been painted and it takes images every single day of the landscape. So this is overlooking some bear habitat and a photo taken every single lunchtime from that phenological camera. What that gives me is an incredible landscape view of how landscapes change on a daily time step. And this becomes relevant for things like bears with food and snow. Now you might say to me, that looks great, Nicholas, but that is just a fancy picture. How do you do anything with that? With all the snow and all the cloud and all the sunlight and all the things impacting that? Well, believe it or not, we can image process our way out of the problem. And I can actually look, divide it up into these tiny squares. I do some fancy comparing of the different spectral bands and it allows me to actually get a very consistent spectral trend over time but allows me to see when the area was snow on a daily basis, when it was greening up, I've got the flowering events of particular species and then ultimately senescence. So I'm able to go away and produce these temporal curves of how vegetation is changing over time from a, from a camera on the ground. So what I wanna do now is link that to something like satellite observations. So we do have Landsat, which might be every 16 days or every month. We have satellites that go over every day, but they've got quite a big pixel, maybe 500 meters. And I've got my camera data. 
we now have fusion techniques that are relatively easy to go away and apply. And because all of this data is free and open, it allows me to go away and make products that have never been out of sea before. Now, if all of you had your microphones on, I assumed you gasped. Because this is 30 meter greenness over Alberta for every single day. So this is the Rocky Mountains on the left-hand side. We're going into the foothills here. So this is the general region. And this is a 30 meter daily estimate. So, so it'll be, it, it would be like what the landscape would be like if Landsat was there every day. So now we can see things like the greening up, the greening down, the senescence of the landscape. And this work with the Foothills Research Institute was to look at where are the food resources best for the bears. So we're now able to get to this level of landscape modeling now by fusing these free and open data sets that we have access to. Now that's good for greenness, believe it or not, I just turn my curves upside down and it's good for snow. This is the Yellowhead region of Alberta. We are mapping snow cover at a 30 meter scale every single day. You can actually see the fusion here. The bigger pixels that look like rectangles, I guess because they are rectangles, uh, they're from MODIS. And then the finer scale patterns you're seeing from Landsat. But what we're doing is we're merging those together at a 30 meter scale. Why is that useful? We're actually modeling ben, a ben, bear emergence from the den and looking at when bears emerge from the den, what is their local access to greenness versus their local access to snow? Uh, and this comes down to the issue of, you know, are bears coming out early, are, are earlier? Are they hibernating later? Is there a mismatch now between how they use the landscape and the resources that are available? We have this for every day from the year 2000 on for this region. So it's extraordinary what these large open data sets are now allowing. So that's a satellite view of what's going on and perhaps the excitement that we now have in that particular area. Of course, the second most exciting thing that's happened in remote sensing in the last 15 years is LIDAR or airborne laser scanning. It is one of the purest because it measures height directly and one of the most exciting remote sensing advances in forestry, but land management in general in the large 15 years, last 15 years. In fact, I would say it's been the biggest revolution in remote sensing since the invention of the aeroplane. So it's an extraordinary data set that gives us this three-dimensional structure. You all know how it works. We all would love to have one in space. We don't have one in space that's useful to map over large areas, but we do have hundreds of providers providing LIDAR data in planes every day. And in fact, the government of Alberta and the government of Quebec have both committed to flying their entire forested areas of their province within the next three years. So this is how much LIDAR data we're now collecting across this country. And of course, smaller provinces like PEI, we had that a long time ago. In fact, it was probably from a handheld device. So we can go different provinces are building more and more and more of these LIDAR data sets that's allowing us to go away and get this three-dimensional structural information. We talk about LIDAR data having three dimensions or three pieces of information that are inherent in that point cloud. Of course, the key one is height. We're understanding the height. For the first time, we're understanding height of vegetation very accurately as measured from an aircraft or ultimately from space. So height is one of the key dimensions. Another is the variance of that height, which allows us to get to structure. When people say, oh, LIDAR is good for structure. Why is LIDAR good for structure? Because it's the variance of the hits that we get back that tells us how variable the points are in a given area on the ground. And then lastly is cover. You can think of LIDAR as like a skewer going through a sponge cake. We've got sponge, cream, jam, sponge, cream, jam. If the laser pulse is the, um, the what did I just call it? The thing that you poke through the cake with, and then you go and look the skewer. If the LIDAR pulse is the skewer, then you can sort of go through different layers and you can work out what's the density of my sponge, what's the density of my cream, what's the density of my jam. So you can actually work out the cover very accurately from LIDAR as well. So you're getting these three dimensions that's allowing you to really think about the vegetation structure over the landscape. We did a work with the, we did work with the government of Alberta looking at the L Alberta LIDAR data we have in Alberta. Now the government compiled wall-to-wall -wall LIDAR data in Alberta about a decade ago. One of the first large-scale 
or broad scale LIDAR data sets from an aeroplane we had in the world when Alberta did that about a decade ago. So we have all this LIDAR data. Some of it's quite old, so it might be quite low in density. Some of it's very new, so very high in density. But even then, you still get these extraordinary patterns of point clouds over the landscape, allowing you to go away and think about structure. So we had a student in my lab who simply took every single LIDAR point cloud over the entire forested part of the province and then clustered it. What do the different structures look like across Alberta? And you can see she came back with eight different structural types when you cluster all the point clouds to give you a structural map of what the forests actually look like in Alberta. So you're used to seeing maps, but think about what maps you normally see. You normally see land cover. This is actually structure, the height, the cover, and the variance of those heights across the landscape. So now you've got a Landsat-based land cover map, which has got all the history over time, and then you've got the LIDAR to give you the structure, the history and the structure, the history and the structure, the history from the Landsat, the structure from the LIDAR coming together to help you understand how that landscape is changing over time. Now, this revolution in LIDAR is really allowing us to see the forest but it actually allows us also to see incredibly accurately the ground. And so this idea of using the DEM from the LIDAR to go away and look at stream networks is also an interesting area to work with in. You can use the LIDAR, pour a bucket of water, recreate the stream network. Once you have a stream network, you can work out the, the slope of the streams. You can work out the gradients of each of the streams, very relevant in British Columbia, which allows us then to go away and see things like how wide are the streams and the bank full width allowing us ultimately to go away and classify riparian and, and stream areas along a river. So this, on the right hand side, this is someone walking along the stream, looking at the fish habitat units by from field survey. Are they a glide? Are they a cascade? Are they a pool? Are they a riffle? And on the left hand side is the LIDAR prediction of exactly the same thing. So we're now able to get the structural information of the forest but if we look at the DEM, we're getting this extraordinary information about the hydraulics, the, the hydrological um, components, actually allowing us to map different habitat units for fish. In British Columbia now, on the island, we are predicting fish populations using LIDAR data. We use all these attributes to tell us the habitat, and from the habitat, then we go away and predict the fish populations. So LIDAR, an incredible technology, both for the structure and the DEM itself. Now, perhaps the third revolution would be our ability to collect our own data. I've talked about satellite programs, I've talked about LIDAR, but you can't go and do that very readily. But now we're seeing this real revolution uh, around collection of your own data. Rick. Thank you, Nicholas, for all your enthusiasm. Uh, so you, we can go away and collect our own remotely sensed uh, data sets at uh, resolutions that were unachie unachievable until a few years ago. There, uh, drone platforms exist in various designs and are available at um, various price points. Uh, this influences how long a drone can stay in the air, as well as the number of sensors and the types of sensors you can might mount to the drone. Um, LiDAR is a sensor uh, that can be used on a drone as well. It creates these very dense point clouds, much denser than uh, you can do with airborne um, with, with, with airborne devices, with airplanes. Um, and they look very similar to, to it. Um, and you can derive, yeah, all the structures on the surface. What is more commonly known or com more commonly used with drones are image-based cameras. You have three main types of cameras, visible light ca cameras or RGB cameras, which are exactly the same as you can find in your phone. Then you have multispectral cameras and hyperspectral cameras. Basically, the spectral res resolution goes up from visible to hyperspectral, increasing the likelihood and the chance that you can detect a uh, signal from a species or an object. Uh, but on the other hand, the, um, the, the resolution, the spatial resolution of um, visible cameras, it is, is, much, is much higher and also uh, more affordable. We can actually um, collect or, or create three-dimensional point clouds um, with this image data as well. Like they look very similar to um, uh, lighter point clouds, but we have to collect imagery in systematic ways with a predefined overlap and at a predefined altitude, um, which ultimately drives the resolution in these data sets. 
So the main, two main uh, data, da data sets that are created are the point cloud, as you've seen, and the Orto mosaic, which is basically a large aerial, aerial image. Um, the process in which these are created is called uh, photochromatic processing, which first includes or, or incorporates image alignment. And in that process, we also determine the position and the orientation of the images. Um, and after that, we can create the dense point cloud. And basically, we all like all pixels in all images are converted to a point in 3D space. A last step is um, where we take all the images and reproject it on a two-dimensional surface, which is then the Orto mosaic. Well, the Orto mosaic is an analysis ready product, but in order to analyze vegetation, uh, analyze vegetation structure and say anything about vegetation height, um, we need to take some additional processing steps. Um, I think most important is uh, ground filtering as uh, we need these ground points to accurately model terrain, which is then needed to convert point height to vegetation height. Then you have these point clouds that you can use for further analysis. Uh, typical for, what is typical is that you aggregate these points over a grid or for tree outlines, and then you go away and use that for your classification or for further modeling of, of environmental metrics. Um, we are looking at ways to, to use these data sets for environmental management today. An example is for monitoring forest regeneration. Um, this is for a project that we, someone else did in the lab um, for the government of Alberta. And here you see data sets collected um, in a production forest of pre predominantly conifers, but also including uh, some aspen. And the data sets were collected before green up in spring. Another example is using drones for monitoring reclamation on pipeline right-of-ways. Basically, on, on all pipeline right-of-ways, we the aim is to, um, uh, to, to recover uh, some level of um, ecosystem functioning, as well as return some um, uh, native uh, community composition. Um, so in, in, in caribou habitat, um, we, we, we also perform, or there's also adaptive restoration performed um, based on bi-yearly monitoring and using a um, reference ecosystem. Um, here, some, 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 there is some, there is some opportunity for some innovation here related to monitoring. Currently, monitoring is done uh, using helicopters uh, as well as field sampling. Uh, helicopters are known to be hazardous, and also, yeah, the, the, the observations lack some sort of detail. And on the other hand, field observations they they cover only limited extents. So my research aims at uh, ma using drone imagery to map vegetation structure and community composition, detect issues along the right of ways, um, map diversity metrics, and use quantifiable targets. So we've, we've collected uh, data uh, on, uh, over three sites cover, uh, covering uh, pipelines to construct in, uh, between 2005 and 2014. Um, first part of my research was focused on ass assessing and mapping vegetation structure. We've done that for vegetation below uh, two meters. We've taken a, um, an unsupervised uh, clustering approach, uh, incorporating a few metrics, as Nicholas discussed, uh, covering um, uh, canopy cover, height, uh, and complexity. This produced nine clusters, which we can relate to vegetation structure types. Um, we found that um, some clusters align uh, with, uh, or actually represent more, more complex and taller vegetation structures, which align with woody vegetation and with tall, tall grass fork communities. On the other hand, um, the structures including the shorter, or the, the, the clusters including the shorter structures were less, of well, less well aligned with vegetation types. However, uh, there was, one class of what was representative of the lack of vegetation structure. Um, so our goal is to use this as a tool for further um, for, for further assessment of regeneration. Um, until very recent and, and currently still, um, I'm, I'm, wor I'm, I'm working on a de de the detection of invasive species 
using high resolution orto imagery. We focus on Canada thistle and meadow hawkweed, which are known to spread rapidly uh, over these right of ways and impact biodiversity. We used two orto mosaics from two, from two sensors, one one centimeter resolution visible uh, light camera created orto mosaic and a multispectral orto mosaic. Um, we expected that spectral, spectral resolution would increase by combining those and that we have more accurate predictions of where these species are. Um, and we actually, well, what we did, we uh, ran three models for both the species um, based on the visible light, based on the multispectral and based on the combined data set. And we saw that the combined data set performed best overall, except in the RGB uh, data sets by itself uh, before before poorly compared to that. Um, so the next the next months I'm I'm, I'm focusing on uh, mapping uh, mapping diversity. So we know from um, from satellite imagery that there is a relationship uh, between spectral variation and in the imagery and uh, species diversity, specifically species richness. I'm 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 looking now if if the same is valid for 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 um, for, for drone imagery. And as, as you know, if you, as you've seen just now, like drone imagery is a very high resolution. So it covers much more of the site heterogeneity. So it might be more challenging. We found, we did some initial exploration and we found some correlation between species richness and spectral variability. But now we're also going away and, 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 and seeing whether we can, uh, we can actually improve this by stratifying um, these correlation assessments and predictions based on vegetation type and maybe looking at uh, less detailed level and looking at higher taxonomic uh, levels. Great, thanks Rick. And just a couple more minutes left. Uh, perhaps the last advance I would, I would postulate would be the idea of advanced computing. So we now have tools and programs and software that can do things that we've never been able to do before, often associated with things like deep learning, big data, and CNN, convolutional neural networks. One area where there's enormous amount of progress with this is in the area of road detection. So we know that updating our road networks at a provincial level or even a fine scale is very challenging. Uh, they aren't particularly well mapped. When they are mapped, they're not particularly accurate. And then the management of those roads, have they been decommissioned? Are they still being used is a very difficult challenge. So if remote sensing can help get to that, then we can actually start to impact the management of the roads. We do see some interesting satellite options there. We do have a CubeSat program called Planet, which is giving us three meter daily imagery of the world. They're pretty crappy cameras. It's like having 200 iPhones in space, but we do get some very fine detail that we can actually then use. And the good thing about these neural algorithms is they become, they look for different patterns in the images that allow us to look for shapes and patterns that the eye can see very easily, but it's difficult to program in a traditional classifier. So we start to see these convolutional neural networks being useful to map roads. We've done this in Alberta as part of the grizzly bear project and then validated it with, da with data sets collected from Road Lab, which you actually put in your car. So if you've got people driving around these roads all the time, they put the app, they run it in the car, it collects the GPS, it works out if the road's bumpy, it records your speed, it records all the different aspects about driving. And that then gives us a layer then that we can then verify against our satellite-based predictions using a convolutional neural network. So the ability to use these algorithms is allowing us to go away and look at road density change. We have the roads from the pot, we have the road from the vector layer from the government. We then have our road prediction of satellite imagery, and we can go away and see how that density of road is changing. And by looking at these different aspects, like how rough and medium and high the the drive, the, the speed or the acceleration or the velocity is, we can use attributes like cover and greenness to then say, okay, we believe there's aspects here that indicate that that road might be decommissioning. Lastly, and perhaps very excitingly, we're also pulling out roads from large point clouds. So this is work done at University of Laval. You can see that when you look at the cross section of the point cloud, you can actually see the roads. And so this is actually an algorithm that walks along the road at 10 meter spans, figuratively, builds up the point cloud and then gives you estimates of not only road size, it gives you the verges, it gives you information about the vegetation on either side. Again, really lending itself towards working out road condition and the decommissioning. So 
Lots of exciting things on the horizon. Free and open data, making broad scale analysis very easy. LIDAR, revolutionizing the way we think about three-dimensional structure. Drones, giving us a capacity to get data we've never had before at a scale previously impossible. And algorithms now that have actually come to fruition that actually allow us to untangle many of the things that we've been able, unable to do before. My thanks to the Canadian Forest Service, TC Energy, MCERT, the Government of Alberta, FRI Research to, for all the work we did in Alberta, University of Laval and our important work of the LIDAR with them and Silver 21, who's supporting some of that work as well. We appreciate the chance to talk to you. My email address is there. We're on Twitter. We have a website. Rick and I are more than happy to answer your questions or talk to you at any time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nicholas and Rick. Um, let me turn my video back on. So um, that was super interesting. And obviously we've received quite a few questions in the chat. Um, just in interest of time, I think we're actually gonna um, ask you if you're maybe willing to answer some of those questions in the chat and not like live, uh, because we would like to move on to the panel discussion. However, if there is time after the panel discussion and there's still some open-ended questions, maybe we can uh, move to the uh, answer. You have some answer, uh, some questions live after the panel discussion. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Kevin. All right, make sure, yes, I am off mute. Um, so hello everybody and welcome to uh, the panel discussion. Uh, so we're pleased to have three additional uh, experts who will be join joining us. Uh, our, our goal with the panel is to hear from these uh, diverse group of remote sensing experts and hopefully spark some discussions. Uh, to get things going, uh, we'll have one question, which I will direct to each uh, panelist. We'll then have uh, three minutes to uh, respond, and then uh, we'll open it up to the rest of the panelists for another uh, three minutes. Uh, I will try to keep everyone on time without stepping on the dis discussions. I have my phone going with my clock right here. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, if you could type your questions into the chat, if we have any time remaining, we will uh, try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the uh, panelists. Uh, so first off, we have uh, Rebecca Edwards. She's a remote sensing analyst with Ducks Unlimited Canada, a national boreal program. Uh, Rebecca has worked with uh, Ducks for the past five years, working on the Northern Wetland Inventories and Geospatial Communications. Uh, she has over eight years of experience in the field of geomatics uh, from earning her BSc in geoscience at Vancouver Island University. Uh, um, MSc in geography, specializing in remote sensing at Queen's University, and uh, her master's thesis focused on analyzing 30-year vegetation change in Iqaluit, Nunavut. Actually, that would be really cool. I'd, I'd like to see that. Um, next on the uh, panel, we have uh, uh, Joanne uh, White. Uh, she's a research scientist with the Canadian Forest Service, specializing in remote sensing ap applications for forest inventory and monitoring. Uh, she received her doctorate of science degree uh, from the Department of Forest Sciences at the U University of Helsinki in Finland and has published more than 188 peer-reviewed publications. Uh, Dr. White is recognized as a global expert in the application of 3D data for forest inventory, uh, leading to the development of two best practices guides and, con and contributing to the national LIDAR acquisition standards. Uh, Dr. White is also an adjunct professor in the Faculty of Forestry at the University of British Columbia and serves on the editorial uh, boards of remote sensing of environment and current forestry reports. Uh, for the past uh, three years, she has been uh, named on the global list of highly cited researchers in both the cross field and geosciences categories. And last on our list, but first in our hearts, uh, Darren uh, Puglia is a research scientist at the Environment and Climate Change Canada and National Wildlife Research Center in the Landscape Science and Technology Division, specializing in geospatial uh, remote sensing uh, analysis. Uh, he leads research on the development of computing infrastructure for geospatial big data processing and machine learning AI for landscape characterization and change monitoring in support of wildlife applications. Uh, his research covers a diverse range of ecosystems at the local uh, to continental scales, including Arctic uh, grassland uh, and agriculture, wetlands and forests contributing to species at risk, biodiversity, climate change and cumulative effects information needs. Uh, he has more than 20 years of experience and numerous publications on these topics. I need to get back to the gym or put more punctuation in these bios. I'm winded just for reading all that. So welcome, uh, welcome panelists. Uh, 
Uh, so we're going to have uh, six six minutes uh, for each uh, question. I'm going to start off uh, with Rebecca. The first question is uh, for you, and I'm starting the stopwatch. Uh, which remote sensing technologies do you think are currently the most uh, useful or re relevant for monitoring environmental impacts? And could you give us uh, an example? Awesome. Thank you so much. I just want to first say I know my time is running, but thank you, Nicholas and Rick, um, for the amazing presentation. Nicholas, your energy is infectious. I'm definitely high adrenaline thinking about remote sensing stuff. So thank you. Uh, but generally with this topic, or we talk about time series and remote sensing, um, Nicholas showed a really good image of just a camera taking pictures over time. And simply that is what time series analysis is. Um, so we can do this in our own homes, you know, picturing a little seedling growing onto a tomato and stuff like that. Um, but as you can imagine, there's so much re remote sensing technology out there um, that can be formed over a, a short time scale over time or large. Um, so this can be in forms of satellite sensors, vector data sets, air photos, and indigenous knowledge. Uh, so it would be a disservice to not mention the ongoing legacy of Landsat, obviously. <laughs> this is the long -going, um, ongoing record of a satellite imagery, 30 meter resolution, widely used for very, very many environmental products. Um, very excited to hear about Landsat 9 as well. Uh, out of my own interest, I have been working on using Landsat imagery to monitor change in wetland productivity and in wetness in different pilot areas in uh, Alberta. Um, this is specifically using the algorithm called LandTrender. Um, people might have heard this before. It's a spectral temporal algorithm which analyzes the spectral hi history of a pixel. Um, the reason I'm kind of diving into this now is because Google Earth Engine has made it more accessible to for a lot of people to use this, um, this product. Um, back when I, so this sounds like I'm so old, but back when I did uh, uh, my master's not too long ago, we had to normalize all the imagery in, over the Landsat time series and it was all manual work. Google Earth Engine now allows that to be all removed and it's so seamless. So um, that's huge. Obviously, Joanne will probably talk about this and comment on that. I follow a lot of her work on Twitter. So that's really cool. My last point I'm gonna mention is work that we're doing currently in partnership with the NASA Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment or NASA Above, which is a three-year project that uses satellite data and cloud computing to map wetlands and wetland inundation frequency, hydro period mapping. So the project involves Sentinel-1 or radar data and uses this uh, over time to uh, threshold inundated areas. So inundation mapping are produced for every Sentinel-2 scene from 2017 to 2019. And this information regarding wetland type, flooding frequency, in addition to waterfowl surveys that DUCS provides, um, will help us model long-term implication of wetland habitat changes for sustainability and distribution of waterfowl populations. That is all I will say on this topic. How long did that take? Uh, three minutes and 13 seconds, Four, Ooh, 50. Pretty good. Um, no, really, really, really good. Uh, so I'll open it up uh, to the panels. Anybody else want to sort of uh, chime in on uh, sort of what they see as maybe the most useful technologies that are, that are sort of coming out now uh, that are, that are re relevant to uh, monitoring environmental impacts? I know, I know we just heard, heard about some in the, in the talk. I think yeah, I think just to echo what Rebecca said, I, you know, I think this ability now to have this long-term record and with Landsat for at 30 meters, we can go back to 1984 and the, the capacity that gives us to have a baseline for monitoring going forward is really important so that, um, and all the, the aspects associated with the Landsat program and the efforts that have gone into the ground segment and the radiometry around that is, is really a really important tool for the community um, for, for monitoring at that spatial resolution. And then of course, as Nicholas said, LIDAR is really a game changer in terms of our ability to understand um, multi-layered canopies and the importance of understory and the whole hydrological system underneath that vegetation. So um, I would say that this long time series and this increased detail vertically is really critical. Thanks. Anybody else come off? I think we're going to go to the next question and more time for questions at the end. 
Uh, the next one is for uh, Darren. Um, uh, can you tell us about uh, what you know about large scale collaborations between organizations and our governments to use some of this remote sensing uh, projects um, uh, for environmental monitoring? Uh, could, is there any examples that you, you could share with us? Well, I'll try. I don't know if I can do it justice, but I'll give it a shot. So first thing I wanna highlight is that remote sensing is very collaborative in nature. It covers a huge range of technical topics from the remote sensing technologies, and then you it's always applied to something. So the domain or application. So there's a you want to collaborate, you typically need partners to do this kind of work because you can't be an expert in all phases of that remote sensing solution, so to speak. And when I was thinking about this question before this, I felt it might be instructive to kind of look at some of the common ways that the remote sensing community collaborates with partners. So the first very common is deriving information. So a partner will identify a gap in existing information or identify a new information need, and then we'll work together, uh, pulling together various pieces of data that we need, being it remote sensing, but a key part to all remote sensing applications is the reference data. And the reference data is what allows us to develop an application and then critically evaluate whether it's working. So, and then we'll be in this feedback mechanism where they're looking at the outputs from the application and telling us what we need to maybe improve. So that's one form of collaboration. The second form I wanna highlight is developing capacity in other organizations. So a lot of times they don't necessarily want us to do everything, they wanna have their own internal capacity. So this will involve forms of knowledge sharing, we'll share code, we'll share data, we'll share equipment. I think there's another interesting opportunity here that's being developed is these collaborative technologies like cloud systems, web interfaces, web tools that previously when we collaborated on a, it very difficult to collaborate on large data sets and technical things just because of the technical limitations and these cloud systems kind of help to alleviate that or at least that's what we're exploring um, in, that, uh, in that avenue. The third point I wanna make about forms of collaboration that we're involved in is using existing information sources. So we've heard the term big data. And with big data, we now have open tools and open processing systems that allows us to derive big information. So an example of that is in Canada, we have maybe more than 20 different land cover data sets covering Canada. And they all have their unique advantages. They're not, they're not all necessarily the best at one thing. They have an advantage and we wanna utilize that in a given application. So myself working in the wildlife group, there might be a caribou application or a bird application. And we wanna find out how do we in create ensembles of these data sets or integrate these data sets for our sort of optimal solution. The second part of the question talks about monitoring and monitoring to me really requires long-term consistency in measurements. And that's something that I think needs to leverage collaboration. And monitoring, I believe in remote sensing is a challenge for a couple of different reasons. So funding tends to be short-term. So we're always kind of cobbling together short-term funding that doesn't lead to development of operational long-term authoritative data sets. The second thing would be the rapid change in remote sensing technologies. So you wanna use the best methods, but you wanna keep your data stream consistent or your information stream consistent. And so they're a little bit at odds with one another. So it's something that needs to be considered in a monitoring program. The final point I wanna make is just some, form, some information requirements from remote sensing, the monitoring is still in the research or prototype phase. So things like fires and harvesting, I think we're doing a really good job at, but other forms of changes, I think we we're, we're maybe still need to do more development. And that would be things like subtle changes, maybe around fire severity, insect defoliation, slower regeneration rates. A uh, common one is always small changes relative to the sensor resolution that we're using. And then changes that occur over short durations. We might be interested in ephemeral, ephemeral water bodies or the timing of uh, agriculture harvest. So that's the what I wanna say about this. And I know it also asked me to talk about examples, but. I knew I wasn't gonna have enough time to talk about examples. So maybe there'll be a questions about international collaboration or grasslands or Arctic. So I'm seeding my question here. 
that uh, maybe we can discuss further. Thanks. Uh, thanks. So I will I will open that up to the the, the panel if anybody wants to uh, uh, come in or or indeed even ask a question at this point. Um, I I have several uh, in my past. I've worked on uh, ten big environmental impact assessments or more, um, where we had to map well over half half a million hectares. And one of our biggest problems was establishing those baseline conditions and and trying to tease out the a uh, pre-industrial uh, disturbance footprint from what would be a post or, or uh, a pre-disturbance pristine com component to, a, you know, where there's some existing anth anthropogenic disturbance, and then putting that in the context of cumulative environmental impact assessments. How might these techniques that I've heard that are much more mature than when I was do doing this in the early two, 2000s uh, help with sort of that scenario? Uh, so if I'm, if I understood correctly, I think what was talked about in the previous, this idea of time series. Time series is extremely powerful. So we can go, we can go back in time and go to that hopefully pre pristine condition or uh, less disturbed condition and look at the uh, environment at that time. If that, does that help? Yeah, yeah I was just saying it, it just wasn't really available when I was doing this work like yeah. years ago. Uh, and, and it seems to be that it's much more available now. All right. Well, we're 30, 30 seconds to go. If anybody wants to add anything more, I'm jumping to the next question. I will add something just really quickly. Um, I agree with everything Darren mentioned, and um, I'm going to kind of name drop the Wetland Knowledge Exchange webinar that we had yesterday on carbon with Kara Webster and Kelly Bona. And we talked with them after about their large scale carbon mapping that they're doing and the lack of field data that is available. And I think that's really huge is when we start looking into more uh, advancements in technology and being able to map at a national scale at quite high accuracies, having those um, that information and especially the Northwest Territories areas that are remote that we don't have data for is extremely important. And that's why collaboration is huge because we don't need to reinvent the wheel but we all need to be working at like certain portions of it. So yeah, hopefully there's more collaboration to come on more national products. Great, um, right on time. Our next question is for uh, Joanna. Um, what, what opportunities do you see for more nationally consistent remote sensing tools uh, and, and out, outputs and, uh, and how, how would these benefit uh, your field, field work or just field work in, in, uh, in general? And, I'm quite interested in this one, once again, from my impact assessment background, this I think is gonna, gonna be very good, thanks. Right, so, so my field is in forest inventory and monitoring. And I, I would put, put to you that remote sensing data is key. It's, it's fundamental and essential uh, in order for us to generate nationally consistent information products about our forests. And I wanna explain a bit about why I think that's the case. So we're a forest nation. We have a huge forest area in Canada. It's over 347 million hectares. And the provinces and territories are vested with responsibility for forest management. So each jurisdiction has its own forest inventory system, uh, which comes with its own design and specifications. And this makes it really challenging to get a nationally consistent picture from these data and it takes considerable effort to harmonize them. Uh, the other issue, of course, is that these inventories are static. They represent the state of the forest at a specific point in time, and we may grow them for, forward th with, with models, but until another inventory is completed at some future point in time, they are static. And in Canada, we also have a large area of what we consider unmanaged forests. So this represents about a third of our forest land area. So these areas aren't managed for timber or any other ecosystem service. They're not subject to intensive protection from natural disturbances, uh, mostly fires. Uh, so for these areas, we have very little to no information um, in a forest inventory sense. Also, Canada is a signatory to several international treaties and conventions. So this gives us um, reporting obligations around the state of our forests. And to support these uh, information needs, we really need nationally synoptic data. Now in Canada, we have a national forest inventory system. It's a sample based inventory. So it draws on about 1% of our land mass to report a spatial statistics. So what we can't get from our national forest inventory are 
maps effectively of attributes of interest. So the information needs associated with forest monitoring are different. They require information um, on a smaller set or more specific set of attributes, if you will, at a much higher temporal frequency that exceeds many forest inventory cycles that we have. And also these data must be spatially explicit. We need maps, um, especially for things like impact assessments, uh, as an example. So remotely sensed data really gives us the opportunity to fill this information need um, to create outputs that are spatially explicit and that have a spatial resolution that capture that human footprint on the landscape. Again, something very important for, for understanding impacts. And, you know, as many, as many of us have said today, that extensive archive that we have from programs such as Landsat really enable us to characterize these attributes at an annual time, time step. Um, and as Nicholas showed, we can get change, we can get land cover, and we can also get a forest structure. We're seeing more and more data come on stream, such as from Sentinel-2, um, as well as the airborne LIDAR data and spaceborne LIDAR, which gives us this critical 3D uh, information on forest structure. So lots of opportunities to combine these data um, to be able to characterize forest dynamics with unprecedented spatial and temporal detail. And this long observation record um, that we have, as I said before, really gives us the capacity to get at baseline. So, you know, like Darren mentioned, we do really well at disturbance detection uh, with remotely sensed data. And that's not really something new. We've been doing that for years and years and years. But what is new now is these time series allow us to look much more closely at how those areas that are disturbed in a stand replacing context, how the vegetation is returning after that disturbance. And with that long baseline, we, we are able to sort of look at that in a much more regionally specific way. So I think all of these things are really important for our monitoring efforts going forward. Thank you. Uh, open it up to anybody on the panel who'd like to have a a question or a comment on this topic? Um, okay, I I do have one. Um, so here in Alberta, as, as as an example, we have the Alberta Vegetation Inventory, which is our forestry uh, system. And, and that's uh, on a scale of five plus years where they try to do the inventory. It's photo interpretation based, and they simply update the inventory for uh, fires and harvests as, as, as they go along. And then they try to renew the whole thing every five years. They've been talking about going to a more of a set of, set of a, a sort of an inventory, an actual census using LIDAR. You could say how many trees are actually there. And, they, and it's been a hot topic in the forest industry for almost a decade. How close are we to actually being able to do that on an annual basis at a, at a sort of a re reasonable cost? Is it, is, it dec is it decades away or are we closer than that? Because it, it's been the holy grail now for at least a decade that I've been working with them. Right, I think this whole concept of continuous forest inventories is really coming to the fore. I guess the question is how that gets done and what technology supports it. So LIDAR is a relatively, when you consider, you know, this Parthenon of different remote sensing tools we have, LIDAR is probably one of the most expensive uh, tools out there. And so I don't, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense for us to be going and acquiring LIDAR data wall to wall for the whole, um, area every year. And I don't see that happening anytime soon. <laughs> um, but there are other, um, other tools out there that um, may enable more of that continuous inventory process. Um, but then, you know, that it's, it's a trade-off, right? Because you're, you're always, you're, the inventories are designed to address some really specific information needs. And they're incredibly valuable, not just for forest management, but for lots of other natural resource um, applications. So I think there's always a trade-off between having that level of detail and then having um, information, other information that perhaps is not as, doesn't have the same level of precision, but it gives you, uh, it comes at a much more greater frequency because you have different information needs. And I think always trying to match the data to the information need is what we as remote sensing scientists struggle with because people come to us all the time with questions about, you know, can I do this? Can I, you know, and it's always about, well, you can do certain components of that um, at, a, at your given spatial resolution, but temporally you won't be able to do that. Or, you know, there's always 
um, kinds of, of trade-offs. And so, so I think, I think we are, I think inventories in Canada in general are under a huge amount of pressure to deliver um, products that have, that have such detailed specifications and so much demand. And, you know, they're, they're, they struggle with all the issues we, everyone struggles with in government about funding and people and, and just the capacity to do that. So I think, um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a challenging question to answer, but I, I don't think we'll be yeah. doing annual LIDAR inventories anytime soon. Okay. Yeah, that's, that was, that's what I thought too, but I'm always blown away by how much the technology is progressing, how fast. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, the cost I think is still the biggest barrier um, for, for more scans. Uh, okay, um, thanks. That was, that was great. Uh, next up, question for, uh, for Rick. Uh, what, uh, what type of challenges do you encounter in your field of remote sensing and how could you uh, and the remote sensing community uh, help to solve them? Yeah, uh, so my answer will be uh, more tailored towards drone imaging, imaging and uh, ecological restoration because uh, that's what I know. Um, so what I see is that we, we have more, more and more and better, better and better understanding of what data types we need for certain uh, for certain applications, for example, for that for, for very almost near uh, plant level assessment, we need maybe two sensors, multiple sensors. We need maybe a higher spectral um, resolution. But yeah, this data is just the images themselves are easy easy to collect, but it also makes it easier to collect data in the wrong way or collect uh, wrong data. That doesn't fit the uh, the, the application. Um, so I think then from the, the, the yeah, just to give an idea, um, you can have some if you have that resolution below of five centimeters, a geometric offset of just a few centimeters um, is your maximum. So you would need to use under. Um, yeah, like benefit, like good conditions. Uh, you need to fly under good weather conditions, for example. You need to use very accurate GPS devices. Um, and on the other hand, if you're covering larger extents, uh, you might need cameras that have a faster frame rate, that are higher resolution, um, uh, drones that can stay longer in the air, just to make that feasible and operational. So I think then from a from, from, from the remote sensing community, a lot of the, um, uh, the, the yeah, like more investment should go into uh, reporting and, and spreading that knowledge to the, to the community. People who want to uh, collect data for certain assessments and that may not be only through like conventional papers, but just also reports and, and talks like this. Um, so that's, that, that's one thing. Um, and I think on, on another, another um, uh, challenge is that as remote sensing scientists, we don't have all the ecological knowledge. And ecological restoration is involves a lot of local um, ecological knowledge about plant interactions between plant soil interactions. So to give an example, um, there is more and more focus on um, how uh, can we improve the success rate, uh, success rate of, of seedlings planted. We can plant them perhaps in areas where there are facilitating plants or where there's the right micro topography. Drones would be ideal to assess these kind of things. Um, but yeah, we need some sort of discussion and we need knowledge of what plants and what how the micro topography looks like uh, that might benefit these plants. And then you can put your seed, your your seeds or your or your little plants there. Uh, and then we can discuss like what kind of data types we would need for that. Um, how we need to fly that, how, how we need to process that um, to develop some ap application for that. Thanks. Yeah, and, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, and I can put you in touch with some, some researchers who are, who are collecting that data. Uh, so feel, feel free to drop me an email. Um, uh, so uh, anybody want to, we are, we're, I'm, I'm going to have to move, move ahead here. We're, we're a little bit behind schedule, but I would like to add anything to this question before I uh, move on. I'd just like to quickly echo what Reich was saying that 
when you're working with drone, you're working at this centimeter scale. And so now geolocation becomes a bigger issue, especially when you're collecting multiple data sets and our GPS precisions might be 10 centimeter and then we're collecting at three centimeter. So it becomes a bit of a challenge, technical challenge that needs to be considered. Okay, all right. And our last question of the prepared questions is for Nicholas. And uh, uh, do you anticipate advancements in remote sensing technologies uh, in the next 10 years? Uh, what do you think these advancements may be and how will they help uh, with the monitoring, with monitoring environmental impacts? No, Kevin, I think all the innovation in remote sensing is dead. I think the good years are behind us. Uh, we will slowly die a death of lack of innovation and scientific renewal. That would be fantastic. I could stop thinking about right, breach the peak. Okay, thank you for asking, Kevin. Five things are going to happen. So free and open data. It will become impossible for a government going forward to say you cannot have this data. The demand by society for free and open data across the board, be it LIDAR, be it inventory, be whatever, will need to be free and open because governments will be held accountable to those data and the decisions they make from them. So the days of not being able to get a data set from a government department, I believe, will be gone in five years and these governments will be shamed into giving us access to that data. So, and that will be global. Well, I guess not in North Korea, but everywhere else besides North Korea, I expect that to happen. Um, Cloud-based solutions, Darren mentioned that as well. I, th I think we are getting to a point where there's going to be companies or um, you know, NGOs or places like that where we can upload our data that will go away and give us a product in a, in a cloud-based way, uh, sort of you know, upload and go type, type sort of approaches. And I think they're going to be tremendously exciting. They are problematic in a way, because you, they may be a bit black boxy. You may have to pay to put your data up on that system. But I do think they're tremendously exciting because a lot of what we're facing now is uh, we have all these advances, but but our uh, and our computers have advanced enormously. But we're now talking about you know very very large computer resources to make these things happen. Rebecca touched on that as well with Google Earth Engine. So I I see these these things like Google Earth Engine, and there's going to be a Microsoft one, Azure sort of. Well, not exactly Google Earth Engine, but, but they're Earth-based cloud solutions and we, Amazon is, is chimping at the bit. So there's no doubt there's going to be these, these global uploading, processing portals that we can use and exploit. Tremendously exciting, some issues, but tremendously exciting. So I think that's going to be a real um, innovation. So the idea of, you know, what software are you using? To some extent, a manager won't have to worry about that as much. It will just be that they put their data up overnight and there'll be a product in the morning they can go away and use. Digital data collection. So there's been a lot of discussion in the chat about drones. Let me just tell you where I, where I think drones fit. Let's think about the ground here and satellites here. Drones are just above the ground. Drones are never going to be a wall-to-wall -wall mapping solution. You can't even let the drone go beyond line of sight without them being illegal. The thing can't stay in the air for more than 35, 40, 45 minutes. So we're not really going to see mapping of the entire oil sands with drones. It's, it's just not a feasible solution at the moment. So I think about drones as recording the field site. We go to a field, we put people out there, we measure things, but we're still only measuring, what, 1% of the land area where we're standing around. What I see will happen, we'll go and measure our 1%, but then we'll fly a drone. We'll fly a drone in exactly the same Rick said, very precise, very exact flying conditions, and you'll bring it back to the office and you will have a full 3D representation of that plot. So that when you come back and say a week later, gee, I wish I'd measured the thistle, suddenly you jump into a program and you would go and visualize the thistle and you would make pseudo plots of where the thistle is. So drones are not competing with Landsat. Drones aren't competing with CubeSats. Drones are competing with people with boots on the ground. And they're going to be a massive cost saving in how we accurately predict what's happening on the ground, but at the ground scale. So when people say, have you validated the drone? Sure, Rick has to do that because he's doing a PhD. But I say that, I'm not going to validate the drone. The drone is my field data with which I want to validate the Landsat. So that's where I see drones fitting in that model. Data fusion, I do think that there's um, a real push there. You know, one of the examples of data fusion is the Sentinel Landsat. So we've talked about Landsat and uh, people mentioned Sentinel-1 radar. 
Uh, Sentinel-2 is Landsat-like, Sentinel-3 is MODIS-like. So the Europeans have this massive program producing very similar satellite configurations that we're used to from the Americans, now giving us double, triple the overpasses we used to have. There's now a harmonized Sentinel Landsat data product. So we know that Landsat's every 16 days. There are two Sentinels, so they're at 16 days, and there's currently two Landsats. So if there's two Landsats and two Sentinels, and each one has 16 days, then my overpass is four days. So they're actually going away and building data sets that bring all of these together. So you get a data set that you don't know whether it's Sentinel, you don't know whether it's Landsat, but it is still a merged fused product. And I've talked about that as well in terms of our snow work and our greenness work. So I think it's exploiting each technology for what it's worth. And I think that's come through a lot of what we've said. You know, LiDAR doesn't replace Landsat, Landsat doesn't replace LiDAR. In some cases, LiDAR doesn't replace air photography. These are all complementary. And the key thing is how do you go away and use them together? That perhaps is the, and I guess we've been saying that for decades. We've been saying it, but it's been very hard to go away and do it. We do now have much more access to tools and technology to make that happen. I do not let a person leave my lab unless they know R and can program in Python. That wouldn't have been the case five years ago. So we're having a much more literate education base of people coming through and knowing how to process this data. They get their hands dirty. They like playing with bits and bytes and they can make these things happen. So I think there's a, there's a real change in, in how we build these data sets, how we process data, and it was, 10 years ago, when perhaps we all just know how to use ArcMap. So to me, they are, they are the main innovations I see happening in the next 10 years. All right. That was great. And and only a little bit over time. So yeah, can I just add, and just a clarification about your question to Joanne, Kevin, you said, are we still going to have an API derived inventory? And Joanne says, I can't see an, a, a LiDAR derived inventory every year, nor can I, but I can see a LiDAR derived inventory once the best we can possibly do it, the best possible accuracy we can, and then we update that. So I, I'm sure Joanne was not implying LIDAR doesn't have a role to play in inventory. It has a critical role to play, perhaps as a baseline, and then we think about how these other technologies can work to do the update. Uh, I, but I agree completely. You know, the Alberta and Quebec, and Quebec and Ontario are looking to use these provincial coverages to build the inventory once and then update it. Yeah. I totally agree. And I think as we move to more intensive sil silviculture away from the more extensive, so we're doing more on a smaller land base, that is a push. I think these techniques become much more reasonable because you're not trying to apply them over the 2.3 million hectares like, like Mercer's <laughs> FMA is, uh, you know, that huge scale. Um, yeah. Okay, so that brings us to the end of these questions. Um, uh, I'm going to open up with the first one uh, for the open, and then I think we're going to be pulling pulling some from the, the chat. So my first question would be: Is is uh, what role can uh, knowledge portals like the like like this one um, um, play in in helping people and practitioners? And that's the sort of the the, the focus of this uh, knowledge knowledge portal. Um, get a hold of these tools and and learn how to use them. So I'm opening that up to everybody. So we we, sh we should all be off mute. And feel, feel free to jump in. We have just a few minutes left. I think the importance of portals like this is one of the one of the barriers to innovation really is being able to access data. And I know that's what we saw with the Landsat program when scenes cost $5,000 each, we weren't doing time series work. Um, so I think this, this capacity to share data allows more people to access it and, and use it in, in ways that they need to for their own work. And I think that's really important, making that data accessible and then sharing the code and the tools. That's really important. Yeah, and I'll also echo that in saying the hardest thing about when you're passionate about your science and you're in your science all the time is the lack of communication outward. And so having a portal that like, yeah, Joanne said, just being able to share data, but just data will communicate that we have this data here in this area and you're welcome to it is important. And I don't know if this portal is the right place, but something I'm thinking about is these days with all these systems, it's really, it be, it's becoming really easy. You push a button, you get a result, but you don't know if that result is good. So I don't know if this portal can be a, a mechanism that allows access to expertise to actually evaluate things and or to know if that method is appropriate or not. Yeah, that's, I, I just want to add. Go ahead. 
Yeah, so so we established uh, like a remote sensing super site at the Petawawa Research Forest, which is the oldest research forest in Canada. And one of the objectives was exactly what Darren's suggesting to put baseline data there, so field reference data or high quality LIDAR data so that when all these other technologies, whether it be a radar or optical data, people can, can have a source of that quality reference data, because that stuff is really expensive and hard to come by, to sort of benchmark these different technologies in a way where they have all this management history about the forest, they know uh, sort of what the, what the conditions are. And that's, that's really um, important as well. We need like a scientist on demand chat function. That connects you to a scientist immediately. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And I know our portal does when when we put up tech, technical notes and and other other sort of the gray literature. That's really where we live. Uh, we do put the uh, contact in, information for the people, uh, and so you, you can reach out to the re, the researchers or their groups. And uh, and and we are building that the tech that page uh, into the portal. So uh, yeah, that is that is our intent is to really focus on those people who want to get on the ground and use the technology and uh and and it's sort of the working uh pra practitioners uh be the we, we want to be the number one resource for them uh, i have a question i think uh do we have any coming from the, the the chat but i have a quick question back in the day uh our gis team i had about four of them working for me they used to turn their computers on friday and go home and come back on monday or tuesday and hope it had finished processing some of what we've talked about here today, um, I know from experience, is a lot of processing power. Has the computing power caught up? Because uh, it really, really was, you had to have specialty machines and, and access to a lot of pro processing power to run some of these tools. Uh, what's the situation now with some of these new methods? Anyone on the panel? I, go ahead, Joanne. No, you go first, Darren. Just going to use an analogy like the idea that you expand the highway and all of a sudden it solves traffic problem for about five minutes. <laughs> right. And it's just, I think it's the same thing. So, yes, compute power's gotten a lot better and accessibility's gotten a lot better, but you raise that bar and now we challenge it with what we want to do. So, I still, yeah, so we still let it grind away and do all kinds of, you know, certainly as researchers, we, we do things that maybe aren't. We just let the computer try to grind things that maybe we shouldn't be asking it to do, but certainly it's still, I would say, an issue at always that cutting or bleeding edge, certainly. And I think and the data as well is also, the volume of data is also increased with the, with the computational power as well. So it's, um, it's, it feels like you're, you're, it's harder to get ahead. Yeah, I feel that way too. And Google Earth Engine has made it so accessible for me to get an image right away. But exporting that into my own thing is another thing. It tiles it a bunch of times. So I feel like, yeah, in some ways we've upgraded and then other ways I'm like, why haven't we figured this out yet? You know, but it's the challenge of it all. Yeah, that, that was exactly what I, how, how, uh, what I wanted to say there. And I, I only didn't have a, uh, as good as an analogy as you have. Um, but yeah, like without the increasing computer power, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to take that high resolution imagery and build point clouds out of that. And that's the, the, the highway analogy. I think we have that computer power and now we want something next or, or it enables something, uh, something new. All right, so um, I know somebody was gonna be looking through the chat for some questions. Um, I wasn't following the chat. Is there any we want to put to the panel here? We have a couple minutes left, I think, and, and then it'll be time for closing. Yeah, we had lots of questions come in. Um, I've been keeping track, Rick answered some of them. So I'll go through some that haven't been answered yet and the entire panel can feel free to answer. Uh, so there were some questions in the chat regarding how to involve indigenous communities in remote sensing work and best practices uh, in terms of ground truthing. And so do any of the panelists have any experience that they can share on this topic? Um, yeah, we at Ducks Unlimited have been working with a lot of Indigenous groups up in the Northwest Territories in the Yukon. Um, I will say I'm working on a project with uh, Casca up in Northern BC. And one of our goals that we like to in, engage the Indigenous Guardians is, is coming up in the helicopter with us and collecting data. So we collect um, helicopter vegetation surveys and 
them being in the helicopter with us, they're recording all the information we're collecting, but they're also sharing their knowledge about where we are. And overall, it's a really, really great experience. And we're hoping to run that a lot this, this summer. And also the Indigenous Guardians program up in Casca, um, they have a drone, they have their drone certification, they're going to take us out, we're going to take some really cool wetland photos. And so, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of opportunity. And so, yeah, I'm excited to work with that. Yeah, so there we have a project on Arctic vegetation characterization, and we work with some local communities. And one of them is involved in the Guardian program. So that's with Blair Kennedy at uh, Environment Canada. So trying to engage them as much as possible. And there is, um, we did have an internal meeting and they talked about how to actually get us better equipped to engage with communities. So I don't know if uh, in the our group can share that document, but something we can look into maybe maybe Matt knows if he's still around. Hi Darren yeah are you referring to Dominique's uh yeah publication yeah, yeah I'll, I'll I'll see if we can share that. Yeah. Awesome. Um so I'll ask another question then. So Janet Hamilton had asked uh what present and future applications of synthetic aperture radar imagery do you see in regards to environmental monitoring uh, with the continued development of programs such as RadarSat and Sentinel? Um, and she said, especially with the recent improvements uh, that we're seeing in spatial resolution. Darren, you have an answer there? You're passing it to me. I was trying to look for the question in the chat. I apologize. I don't know if I fully, fully grasped it. I can I can paste it in for you right now. We could start by having RCM data freely available from every image available to the entire Canadian community. That, so that would be a start, free and open data. Uh, start with that. I think, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Darren answer that. I mean, I can certainly try. We do a lot. A lot of our radar is focused on wetlands, and then there is some applications associated with um, erosion and erosion along coastal environments. So that that kind of thing. But I mean, yeah, in I I don't want to comment on the radar sat policy. I mean, it's the Canadian policy, and we have to work with it. So, but it does limit its use. So it's unfortunate in that respect because it can be a useful data set for a lot of applications, but because it's not as publicly accessible, it, it does limit its use. I think though that will evolve over time. I think the Sentinel program with Sentinel-1 has really set the benchmark for not only open data, but also analysis ready data. That's one of the critical barriers to the use of more SAR, I think. And so analysis ready products and also tools. So with the things like SNAP, for example, the development of that. And so it, again, it's about open data, analysis ready data, tools. So there's standardized workflows and processing streams that people can use and sort of radars lag behind other types of data in terms of having those. And I think Sentinel's really changed that. And um, there are a lot of uh, radar, pro radar satellites to be launched, MISAR in particular, uh, so biomass specific missions. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see um, where, that, where that goes. Uh, Kevin and Caroline, do we have more time for questions or is that our limit? I think we're getting close to the end um, and I hate to put like, you know, uh, kill a good party, but um, I think we should respect people's time. And I do want to thank you all tremendously, um, especially to Nick, Nicholas and Rick, like thank you for your time and your effort putting into that presentation. That was super interesting. And of course, by providing some answers as part of the panel discussion and through the chat and of course our panel panelists as well so Rebecca Joanne and Darren thank you so much for joining us today 
Um, as a token of appreciation, we will be sending you a small gift on behalf of the CCLM. So keep an eye on your actual physical mailbox. Uh, and thank you to all who attended today. I think we definitely had a record number of people attending. So thank you all. Uh, keep checking the CCLM uh, portal, the website, for more information on our next webinar. Uh, and of course, for additional knowledge exchange products that we will be publishing this year. And really, for any of your conservation uh, information needs, uh, have a look at the CCLM portal. I'm sure we can, uh, you can find it there. Uh, before you go, um, I think we have a little uh, survey. Um, I think somebody's going to put that in the chat. Uh, so if you can um, click on that, and otherwise we would love to see you next time um, as well. So thank you all. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. I'm not sure if this survey is going to show up, but if you have any other feedback, uh, please send an email to either Christy or, uh, or the admin at cclmportal.ca and we will definitely, um, definitely get back to you. So thank you all very much for your time today and we look forward to our next, uh, to our next session. Thank you. And as a last note, it was uh, the evaluation was put in the chat. So if you can click on that, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. <laughs>